Hey guys, what's going on? This is Matt Winning at winningstrength.com and today we're going to go into a little bit of the science on how and why we train the way we do at winningstrength.com. Hopefully a couple of you guys will change your training and start to follow a little bit more of the methods that we utilize in order to make long-term progress, reduce injury, and avoid burnout. After all, periodization is designed to fix or manipulate those areas in a positive fashion. So for most people that don't believe in periodization, I find it very, very difficult to understand what their motives are with that when we've known about periodization for about 75 or 80 years. The Russians had studied this extensively before even about 1972 to 75, and we are still playing catch up today in sports and even in lifting in general. So let's get to this. But before we do, please go visit our sponsors, ATP Labs, and check out winningstrength.com for all of this stuff already built into the manuals and online coaching. So let's get to it. So I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible so that you guys can follow along and hopefully make some changes in your training. So this would be, for instance, the most force that we could produce. And I'll explain this point here in a second. And this would be the fastest that we could possibly move. And we have everything in between there. This is called the force velocity curve. Now, the force velocity curve looks like this. Okay. Let me get a better color for you. That blue one seems to be wearing out. So let's go to a different color. Okay. Much better. So force velocity is in a relationship of inverseness. So what does that mean? That means the more we put weight on the bar or the heavier something is, the slower we can move it quickly. Makes pretty decent sense, right? And so when we train, we need to make sure that force and velocity are both manipulated and constructed in our training in order to get the most out of what we want. So what do we want? Well, let's break it down like we're a power lifter. Power lifting at a maximal effort is gonna focus mostly on this area right here, okay? This point right here constitutes isometric, okay? Now after that point, we have this, this little tail. This is eccentric. So this should make pretty much good sense that you can lift more eccentrically than concentrically, right? Every one of you guys watching this video can bench press 405 on the way down, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can lift it on the way up, right? So we're all stronger in an eccentric portion of the movement. Right here, it's as heavy as possible. It's almost isometric. It barely moves. It's like your one rep maximum sits right here, okay? Now, when you're throwing, say, a baseball, that's going to be somewhere in this range right here. It's light enough to where when you throw it, you can put a lot of power and speed into it because it's not that heavy, right? So what we need to do is we need to break this down into different segments so that you can understand why we train the way that we do. So as we've explained before, this right here would be considered the max effort method, okay? ME. So ME stands for maximal effort. This means that we're going about as hard as we can, but we're not focused on bar speed. We're focused on amount. When somebody asks you how much you bench, this is the number you give them. This is your one rep max, maybe your two rep max, right? Now in between here is what you can do either for reps or for certain aspects of speed. So what we call this area here is RE method. Now this is the position in which we're lifting a load and it may be a, a moderate tempo, like a 2-2 two -two tempo or even a 1-1 one -one tempo, but we can probably get 6, 8, 10, or 12 reps in here, right here, right? So this is considered what I like to call the repetition effort method based in this area right here. Now the last part of this is and it's a hybrid, it's in between here, is DE. And that's the dynamic effort method. That means we have a certain percentages, 
usually something submaximal, somewhere around a little under 50 or a little over 50%, and we're moving it with as much force as possible, high bar speed. So right here, what we're looking at, and if you wanna break this down in meters per second, which you can do, what I would say is this right here is anything above one meters per second, okay? Anything here is probably somewhere between 0.6 and 0 0.8 meters per second if you want to move it as fast as possible. And right here is going to be very, very slow. We're talking 0.2 to 0.4 meters per second. That's a rough guesstimate, but that is where you start in, insinuating and focusing on being able to create high bar speed. So how does this get affected from these two? Well, let's dive into that next. So in training, when somebody talks about special strengths, Louis Simmons used to be big on talking about special strengths and a lot of people got confused on what that meant. And you don't even hear anybody talking about it anymore, which is unfortunate because I feel that 20, 25 years ago, we were more advanced with our training than we are now. Why? Because training and strength conditioning has been more pushed towards quick access social media. People that are very popular on YouTube, Instagram, these types of things, maybe don't have this level of information to give. And plus, the ones that are watching this right now tend to be a little smarter than everybody else and start realizing, holy shit, there might be some things that I'm missing on training that I probably should start focusing on. So this particular part is understanding that there are all different avenues of strength that we need to be focusing on on a weekly basis. Now, why do we focus on different kinds of strength? Well, a couple reasons. One, if we only focus on one type of strength, then our transfer to either sports or the real world is limited, right? So just using maximal effort method will get you stronger, but it's not necessarily gonna put on any more muscle mass. And just if you use only speed work, then you're gonna get quicker but your level of maximal strength may not increase and your level of hypertrophy won't increase either because your volume's not high enough. And if we only focus in the middle, which is what I would consider the repetition method, then what you're gonna get is hypertrophy, but it's not necessarily gonna transfer that well over to strength or speed. So what we need is we need all three variables to be manipulated based on the fact of which one we need the most. For most people, what I see is that their maximal strength is low so it, it reduces the amount of weight that they can use for explosive power. And so that starts to create a problem, right? If I'm a 500 pound bencher, I can use more weight for speed work than somebody that benches 225, right? If we base that around 30 to 50%, do the math real quick, what's 30 to 50% of 500 and 30 to 50% of 225, right? The point is, is that we need to get absolutely strong in order for a lot of these others to follow alignment. I look at it this way too. If somebody's a 500 pound bencher, then using 100 pound dumbbells for volume, i.e. doing burnout sets, um, even in some instances winning warmups, utilization of 100 pound dumbbells for sets of 10 to 12, maybe 15, depending on the tempo, is not gonna be that big of a deal. But if somebody's only bench pressing 225, 100 pound dumbbells are off limits. They probably can't even do it for one. So the point being is absolute strength tends to regulate what you can utilize for repetition method, but it also regulates in a percentage base of what you can use for speed work. So this is why absolute strength is so important. But my question is, why is it ignored so often? It's ignored because it's extremely hard, and most people look at absolute strength as being more dangerous than doing reps. I would counter that saying that reps under poor fatigue creates bad situations with technique. If somebody only fails something one time, i.e. a one rep max, in my opinion, it's safer than failing at a six rep max because unless you're skilled, every rep that you accumulate that fatigue, you're probably gonna be getting worse and worse with your form. So again, by the sixth rep, it's gonna look terrible, whereas with the one rep max, if your form breaks even slightly, it's probably not gonna let you get the weights. And so I think we have kind of compartmentalized absolute strength into being more dangerous when it actually it's probably a little safer. So now what we want to do is we want to separate our ideals. And this is just based on max effort and dynamic effort because the repetition method is complex. 
But what we want to do is focus our training part of the week here and part of the week here. Okay. That's why if you come on the apps, you'll see us doing max work. And then 72 hours later with the same muscle group, we'll do speed work. The reason is we want to change, train a vast array of the force velocity curve on a weekly basis. This allows the neurological system, if I'm moving something fast as possible, moderately, I'm going to turn on almost the same amount of fibers as if I go heavy and slow. So it's a way to get neurological change out of your training without going heavy as hell all the time. Because using the max effort method too often creates massive burnout. If we look at AS Prolopin's chart, it comes down to around six to eight different movements over 90% in a monthly period. Meaning that if we go over that, say we use the maximal effort twice a week, which will be around 14 to 15 lifts, maybe over 85, 90%, your nervous system is not going to be able to handle that. But it can handle going high velocity and then high strain and separate it 72 hours apart. This allows us to work on rate of force and then absolute strength at the same time. So when you hear people talk about, man, I don't know about lifting weights, it thinks it makes you slow with sports. Initially, it does until the central nervous system catches up. And if you don't want that to happen, training rate of force or the dynamic effort method and your maximal strength will transfer over into power and speed. Back to our original force velocity curve, we start talking and asking ourselves about bands and chains. Now, this is one particular interesting information, but bands and chains actually change the force velocity curve and move it out here. So we're able to strain a little bit faster, get to our deeper motor units faster, and we're able to sustain a longer and harder contraction for a longer period of time under a high velocity. So what does this mean? This means bands and chains are absolutely useful in our training, and they make our speed work actually more functional because then we have to push against something that's gradually getting heavier. And so I just shot another video about how to set up chains that'll probably be on YouTube before this video. But the point being is we're actually manipulating the force velocity curve. We're getting stronger and faster at the same rate with bands and chains. And so again, when you're basing your training on absolute strength and dynamic effort method, and you're utilizing accommodative resistance, you have the best of all worlds. You're able to get stronger, faster, more explosive and innervate fibers at a deeper level much quicker. And so again, you're always looking for a way to manipulate the force velocity curve and this is a great way to do so. So some key takeaways from this video is neither one is more important than the other. We need maximal effort work in order to strain and get internal and external motor unit coordination. And we need the dynamic effort work for rate of force development and internal external motor unit coordination. This is mostly a neurological mindset of how to train. To use max effort method and dynamic effort method in a weekly phase, you want 72 hours apart between these two for full neurological restoration. This is important for consistency. Could you train max effort and dynamic effort closer? Maybe, but for not very long. The point is, is that I've been following this system for about 26 years and has created zero shoulder problems, zero back problems, zero knee issues. And by this time in my career, I should probably be in a fucking wheelchair from squatting 1200 pounds in equipment, benching well over 800 in a shirt, 611 raw, deadlifting 800 multiple times. Um, you know, all of these different factors on top of the world records raw with no knee wraps squats. And how is that possible? It's possible because one, this is a long-term mindset. Two, you're utilizing different types of contractions and hopefully different exercises in order to attain these different methods of training, i.e., you know, we don't always free squat. We don't always straight bar bench press. We don't always deadlift a conventional or sumo. We mix and match things around, changing the pressures. And so again, we want to manipulate the force velocity curve, but we also want to manipulate the exercises in which we attack. The fastest way to get better is to train super specific, but it's also the fastest way to overuse injuries, mental burnout, and overall just staleness. You need variety. So in my book, when it finally comes out, hopefully within the next year from Human Kinetics, you'll see my recommendations for how many exercises you should master when you're a beginner, when you're intermediate, and when you're advanced. 
And a lot of this comes down to rate of force development and understanding that you need to get faster. This is why on the apps we have plyometric training in off seasons. If you want to know what an off season should look like, go to the website and download, download the off season manual. But if you want to follow a yearly process, come onto the apps on the website and we can get you squared away. But again, make sure that you're straining and make sure that you're being explosive all in the same week and try to separate it with a timely amount of restoration. Talk to you guys soon and visit winningstrength.com.